field in Rio for the World Cup final, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, our next two guests were the people who were chosen by BBC Sport to cover that event for around two million people uh, that were looking in on the coverage from the UK. So I'm sure as you agree, there's absolutely no pressure on, on them whatsoever. Um, the two of Britain's uh, leading online sports journalists. So I'd like to introduce former Leeds Trinity graduate Paul Fletcher uh, and Tom Roston, who so amongst other things is also my old university housemate. So, ready? Okay. Anyway, guys. Hello, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so I'm Paul Fletcher. I used to be a student here, graduated probably before most of you were born, which is not great news, but um, yeah, no, it's great to be back 20 years later. We're here to talk to you about last year's World Cup and how the BBC website covered the tournament. Um, Tom is going to talk more later on about what happened in Salford, which was really a lot of the engine room of the, of the production. I'm going to talk a little bit more about, phones off please, about what happened out in Brazil where we had quite a big BBC team, but for the website, it was a lot smaller than it was for TV and radio. Most of the team were back in, uh, in the Salford studios where the BBC are now based for sport in Media City. Not sure whether any of you have been there, but it's a pretty impressive setup if you get the chance to uh, take a look. I guess one of the first things to stress is that when you see a World Cup and you watch it on TV, you listen on the radio, you read the reports on the website, you know, it, it's very well put together, I think, for the BBC and ITV as well, but it's years in the making, particularly on uh, TV, but also on the website. Um, we've got a few slides to uh, take you through today. Um, and this one just outlines what we did, really. We would live commentary on every game, match reports on every game, reporters, as I said, out in Brazil and Salford, loads of reaction, analysis, features, there was video, there was all sorts of stuff going on. It was a really, really big deal for the BBC because we live in a world now where rights are very competitive, but obviously the World Cup is something that you get a lot of on the BBC, so we really wanted to make the most of it as a really big BBC production. And as I hinted at before, a lot of that is years in the making. And this sort of stuff just gives you an idea. I mean, this looks really boring. and. Um, I wouldn't get too into studying this particular slide, but what it does do is give you an idea of the planning. You've got multiple games on during a World Cup in June. They all require different organisers to look after what we do, different live text commentators. Tom here is, I think, is, is the best in the business, but he's a very modest lad, so he never say so himself. But we've also got match reporters, uh, out there in Brazil feeding their reports back and the copy and all the different news stuff. And it's pretty much, when you're out in Brazil with the time zones, a 24-hour operation. But you've also got test matches going on in June. There's Wimbledon going on. It's like we've only got so many staff. How do we fit them all together? It's a real jigsaw puzzle that takes um, sort of ages to sort out. And then eventually you get a rotor coming out. So any of you thinking of going into sports journalism, it's probably worth bearing in mind that um, the sexy end of the business, being out in Brazil and presenting from the Copacabana, is right at the top of the tree. And that to get there, there's probably a lot of different things that you've got to do, and there's probably a lot of different shifts that you've got to work. Early starts, overnight shifts, weekends, missing out on your birthday night out, all that sort of stuff is pretty much par for the course. On the World Cup, as you can see here, with people starting at six, at working through till four and then other people came in at four and were working through till two and some of the games I think one of them kicked off at 3 a.m. people were there all night people who work on Formula One for us you know they're doing Grand Prix's where um, they're coming in and working right over the night the same with the Cricket World Cup now I mean those people haven't seen daylight in weeks and that's a tournament that never seems to end so you know, when we're on late shifts going home at midnight, they're just coming in wondering what their wife and children look like. Um, and then we'll take a little bit more of a look now about Brazil. And there it's worth... <laughs> <laughs> and it's worth... what it was like for you for yeah. four weeks. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, and it's worth stressing here that we're talking largely about football and the World Cup. Now, if you're into sport or you want to go into news, 
but you're not really into football, hopefully a lot of what we're going to talk about will be relevant because a lot of what we're talking about is about covering live stuff. And the BBC now, they've got this big thing called BBC Live. So whether you're in sport or news, big events, people want their information now. They don't want reports hours after. They want to know what's going on right now. So covering news and sport live is really where we're at right now. And it's only going to go more in that direction. It's going to go more in that direction because now, more than ever, you know, everyone gets their news on this. It's all about the mobile phone. It's not waiting to go home and getting it on your desktop anymore. Every Saturday, every Saturday afternoon, more people are getting scores on the BBC website off their mobiles or their tablets and that sort of stuff than they are at desktop. People want stuff, you know, yesterday now. It's a real immediate world. So all of this sort of stuff about covering a major tournament, a lot of it would apply to other sort of stuff as well. So whatever job you end up going into straight from here, more than ever now, I would say you're going to have to do live stuff. Uh, I think of one example... Someone sent us around the office a brilliant live that a paper in Reading were doing on uh, when Broadchurch was on, because like one scene in the whole series was filmed in Reading. <laughs> so the local paper every week were doing this live text of, is that Reading? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that housing estate's in Bracknell, not sure. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a silly example, but say you go to work in a paper in Leeds and there's a shooting or a big, big event, I'm guessing now the first thing they'll do Let's get a live page on it, get some photos into it, get some tweets and people's reaction. So as, as Paul says, you might be sitting there thinking, I'm not interested in football. Forget that for the time being. Just think, how, how do we cover events as they happen now? Because that's, that's all that you'll be doing pretty much as soon as you leave here, I, I would imagine, and more so as you, as you go on. So there's Paul in uh, Brazil while we were uh, <laughs> hunkering down in the snow in Salford. Um, this is where you were for base? Yeah, that's right. So it's worth saying that um, most of the stuff in terms of where it was all based was in Rio de Janeiro, but everything was miles apart, so it was a real logistical challenge. The International Broadcast Centre was where all the broadcasters in the main were based, and that was here. And then this over here is Copacabana, where everyone was getting hammered all day, and loads of people had their TV studios. And the Maracanã, the stadium, was up here. And as a crow flies, it's not very big, but there's only sort of one road in and out of these sort of places, and it took hours to get anywhere. So it's a huge logistical challenge, which again goes back to the planning. Uh, getting around took ages. It was a bit frustrating. This was where the BBC had a office, uh, and this not is a no, no. I wasn't in this office. <laughs> this is where the TV production people were, and this is the view from their office. And the window that I took this out, as a little aside, was um, always closed, even though it was really hot, because the guy who had the seat next to the window had some really strange phobia that gave him a near compulsion to jump out of open <laughs> windows. So even though it was 30 degrees, this office was just covered in fans all the time. And across the road from here, if you imagine we're sort of looking out this way, this is where the TV studios were. So this is the main road around the Copacabana, and they just built it over the top. And I think the BBC had this one here, I think. So that's where you were looking at Gary Lineker et al. all the time. ITV was bottom, weren't they? Yeah, ITV were bottom. So when things got a little bit tasty at different times, they were within range, um, which the BBC weren't. So that was good news for them. Didn't their windows get hit by a stone or something? Yeah, like yeah. when there was a little agitation after one game, they, they were unfortunate. And then down on the beach was the Fan Fest, where fans could go and watch if they didn't have tickets, go and watch it all on the beach. So, you know, it was a real good sort of, you know, place to work and, and to cover the, the different stuff that happened. But back in the IBC, the International Broadcast Centre, oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> this was my hotel here, and this was a pretty amazing beach, and there was the sea. So when we arrived, I thought, well, there's nothing wrong with this trip. Everything's perfect. And then the next day, I went to work, where I spent 14 hours a day, and it was here. <laughs> <coughs> um, and this is the BBC office. It's just a giant sort of conference centre where they built what, to me, looked like massive shoe boxes with no windows. To put it into context, Fletch, how big... 
mean, I did the Olympics in London, and there was a big IBC. Was it how many people were in there? Would you reckon? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean thousands. <laughs> um, but I don't think it was as big as the one they had at the Olympics. The one at the Olympics, because it was all on one site, was huge. Whereas a lot of people in Brazil, if they could afford it, had a lot of their staff in the Copacabana. But this, the International Broadcast Center, a lot of the major broadcasters were there. Um, is that, it work? That's, hard at work? that's me, hard at work at my desk. No windows, just plywood in every direction. It was like living on a very bad building estate. So that's where you were all day. So just to sort of put it all in perspective, the sort of glamour of it all was, you know, great for Gary and great for his presentation point, but the nuts and bolts of where it all took place, a lot of it was a lot more functional. And it is worth stressing that these sort of gigs, when you land them, that only happen a few times in your career, are absolutely amazing, but um, you do have to work really bloody hard, and um, your view for most of the time wasn't, wasn't of sand or beach at all. You'd wake up and see that and then leave it all day. It was kind of torture in its own way. But what just hours were you doing in there? Well, you'd sort of get there about seven and then leave at seven or eight or nine, but then some of the games were in the evening, Brazilian time, so you'd stay a little bit later. So they were quite long days. Um, but good with it as well. Um, the other side of it, though. Yeah, so this, just to give you an example of what the press box looks like, this is just after the final, and you can just see down at the bottom all the little monitors, and it's huge. It goes on and on and on and on and on. All the world's press are there, and it's kind of exciting and vibrant, and there's all sorts of different cultures and peoples and ideas, and it is really an exciting place to be around that sort of press box. There's a real frisson, especially around the World Cup final. And if you ever do get the chance to cover that sort of stuff, it is absolutely amazing. And I would advise you to you know, sort of savour every single moment. This was the piece that I wrote after that game. It was just a colour piece about the sort of atmosphere around the ground during the day. Um, and, and, you know, that was the product of, of you know, what I did See on the, the final. the time there, that's what time... People like me in Salford were putting that up on the website while you were enjoying yourself. <laughs> so, you know. uh, not strictly true. <laughs> but, and this one is just a little aside in the toilets in the Maracanã, just to give you a, a, you know, a small idea of the level of detail of organisation around the World Cup. I mean, you know, even when you went to the toilets, they were telling you what you could and couldn't do there in English and Brazilian. It was. The level of detail that goes into organising one of these tournaments is absolutely staggering and it amazes me. You know, FIFA get a lot of heat, quite rightly, for a lot of stuff, but the level of detail involved in organising these tournaments is, is mind-blowing, really. So uh, in, in Brazil, Fletch, you had quite an office-based role. Yes, very much so, yeah. not the only World Cup that you've done. Yeah, so this was Germany 2006. And I guess this just taps into, somebody asked me before how quickly they thought the sort of sports journalism was changing. And I wanted to put a few slides on this one just to give you an idea. Back in 2006, the brief that I was given for this tournament was to make it a bit more light-hearted and a bit more jokey. And what they did was, uh, the BBC, they hired a camper van, this one, and me and this guy drove around Germany for six weeks going to a few games, but mainly mixing in with the fans, and we had a blog, and the idea was we just wrote this blog of our trip, experiencing the World Cup in Germany, and we would ask people for ideas about what we should do next, and a lot of them, uh, if they were sensible enough and, and legal, we would try and do so. So it, our sort of map around Germany and the route that we did was determined by our readers, which was great. Unfortunately, this camper van, which we nicknamed Svan, uh, Sven Joran Eriksson was a manager at the time, kept breaking down. It's just gone here in a car park, so my partner in crime there is looking a Not bit staged, upset. No stage, no. And the back got ripped off when he hit the corner turning, so it wasn't without its problems, but it was a really great trip. And it, you know, it was back then, it was like the idea of a blog and a sports blog was kind of new, and it's like, well, where are we going with this? But now, you know, the idea of social interaction and the idea of, you know, Twitter and Flickr and all those sorts of things, you know, people, that is just second nature. That's how we access news. So, Is it worth pointing out as well, this was sort of pre-recession. Would you say there's more money around than doing this sort of thing? You don't see so many people. No. There. And, I, you know, I think it was interesting in its time, but I don't think we'd do it again now. I think we're a little bit more news-focused now. But 
you know, back then nobody quite knew what to do with blogs, so this was one idea of, of how to get around Germany. Can we just go back to... Mm -hmm. And just to give you an idea about, this is after a South Korea game. If you ever get the chance to cover, a, you know, a major final, a major sporting <coughs> event, and afterwards you go into the mix zone to try and get interviews, you know, it can be a real bun fight. You know, a player might stop, like they are here. If you imagine this sort of little... Um, path that is walking down. FIFA have set that up with barriers on either side. The first lot will just be TV, the second lot will be radio, and then everybody else will get them when they're sort of slightly wearily trudging through. You ask them to stop, you ask them questions. The bigger the name, the more people. I was in one once in Germany and Samuel Leto stopped. Cameroon had just been knocked out. And I thought I'd landed the golden ticket because I was here and Eto was there. But then so many people descended on me, the barrier collapsed and I was sort of falling into Eto's lap, which was <laughs> pretty embarrassing and quite dangerous. So, uh, something to be mindful of. Um, and then in 2010, again, I was lucky enough to land what I thought was a pretty good assignment there. The idea was the BBC had this double-decker bus um, that they wanted to, this is the one, it was shipped out and then they rigged it up so that you could do reporting from it and you could do live broadcasting. <coughs> up at the top here, it had an edit suite so people could turn around video. Um, it had a sort of studio towards the back. This side could drop down and you had a nice little backdrop. And the idea with this one was that in 2010, it was the first World Cup in Africa and the BBC really wanted to get around the place and tell the story. So they wanted to get out of the big shiny new stadiums and into the townships where you know the um, the markings on a pitch would look like this and they wanted to really tell a story about what life was like in Africa and how you know ordinary people who didn't have any chance of getting any tickets were trying to um, you know w were embracing the World Cup or otherwise did did the majority black people in South Africa how did they feel about it how did the whites feel about it how did you know, the nation come together as a whole to embrace the World Cup. So this, the idea behind the, um, behind the, the, uh, the double-decker bus was that it'd go right around the country, which it did. It was a massive operation. Just to give you an idea, there, was two, um, there were two presenters on the bus. Dan Walker was one of them, the uh, football focus presenter. There was uh, one online journalist, that was me, a radio presenter. There was a technician, two cameramen, one editor, two directors, a producer, and three security guards in case we went into townships and stuff. One of whom was about that big. He was in his mid-50s. He was blind in one eye and he had 30% movement in one arm. But <laughs> having done 20 years in the Rhodesian SAS and having technically been dead twice, I was disinclined to mess with him. Um, <coughs> so that was you know, just another example of another way in which you can cover uh, a major tournament from the field just to give it a sort of a different feel and a different look so that everything is you know not the same uh, is, it, is this an example of sport not always just about what's on the pitch that you might might branch out <coughs> into these bigger stories yeah that is a great question and for a world cup like this in south africa that's absolutely right because there's a bigger story to be told around the world cup especially the first african world cup that was a big story in itself in addition to what happened on the field. And you had to really get under the skin of that story and try and tell it in different ways. It was a cultural story as much as a sporting story, and that's what we were trying to tap into there. Right, so there's Fletch uh, gallivanting around the world. Um, this is what we were up to back in Salford. Uh, that's sort of the start of the shift, and then this is about halfway through. Because um, working funny hours, which we do, plays havoc with your uh, diet, put on about stone. Um, but what were we up to? Right, so writing a live text commentary, which is the most sort of the busiest pages that we have, um, not just for the World Cup, but all through football. But like I say, these are now, don't think of it as just football. Um, like I say, you might have to do one on, on Broadchurch or. <laughs> Good luck with that or anything. Um, so just some fundamentals, really. Uh, obviously, it's obvious, but do your research. Uh, for example, know whether this guy is um, Socrates, Papa Stuff, Papalos, or Lazarus, 
Christodoulopoulos. And don't forget, you'll have to type that name maybe 20 times in a, in a, in a game. So hopefully you'll have a quiet one. Hopefully he stays out of it. Um, but this also applies to football. is not so bad for me. Luckily, it's my main sport. I like to think I know a little bit about what I'm doing. But you might get, during the Olympics, for example, I like to do, could be anything, what's going on. Can you, oh, Britain are going to win a medal in the judo nightmare scenario. So then, you know, like, I don't know what's going on. What are the rules? Like, you have to know, obviously know a bit, but does anyone know what an Ippon is, really? Even the experts were struggling there. So, it's obviously, if you're doing a news one, even more, even more important. Know, know what's going on, what's the police procedure, all that sort of stuff. Um, here's a little look of... So that was our front page on the, the World Cup final. So you can see the main thing here. You could watch the game within that page itself and uh, obviously our live text commentary. Uh, let me just show you one. So this is what they... Hopefully you've all seen one or seen a news one. Have you all seen these live texts? Do, do a lot of you use the BBC website for sport? Yes, right answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you can stay where you are. So you can see when we were talking a little bit about how people want interactivity or whatever. So here, in this example, we've got a vote. So these were, were these new for the World Cup? Mm -hmm. So now you can vote within a page and where should England, where should we well, should use Wayne Rooney in England's next match? I also note here that I was a bit, uh, I was calling England an encouraging display there <laughs> after the first game. That was a little bit off topic. But, um, so that's what it looks like on the site. And... Again, just the fundamentals, again, it's obvious, but you've really got to keep your entries maybe one a minute. During a game, sometimes more, or often more, because although it's sort of my name on there, this is much more than a one-man job. You know, we have, for the World Cup final, probably, I can't remember now, but there'll be seven or eight people in. So I'll be sort of typing it up. Um, let me show you. So this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like for you when you're using it. So this stuff on the right here is stuff that's been published. And then down here, this, end, this where it's, I should have done one when there was stuff in it, but that is an area where you save stuff before it gets published. So the beauty of this is, as I say, there might be six or seven of you in a team covering an event. So one of you will, will publish everything, but so while I'm typing what's happening, someone might be putting some pictures in there or some tweets or some stuff from Fletch in Brazil, for example. So you, you have to think of it as you're not just an author of it, you're like the editor as well. Um, but also to bear in mind with this live reporting is there's no filter really between you and potentially two million people. So once you hit publish, it's gone. It's not like you write a story, you give it to the subs desk, someone checks it all for spellings, make sure it all makes sense. So, partly you need to be very wary of that, but also don't think about it too much because you'd be too scared to write anything, I think, if you... Hopefully, just don't make any mistakes, the best advice. Um, so that's just a little example of, of what it looks like when there's England scoring a goal, rare event during the World Cup. Um, what was great about the World Cup and the FA Cup now, stuff that we've got the rights for, is as well as images you get from Getty or whatever, or, um, we could actually use screenshots because we had the rights. So in Salford, there's a whole team who look after all the TV footage and they were able to snip effectively like a, a snapshot of the actual TV action. So that means we could score a goal. The first thing we'd flash up is hopefully within about 10 seconds we would publish that we've scored and Daniel Sturridge just scored it. And then maybe a minute later, my entry would go through. And then during the World Cup, almost as quickly as I'd written it, we'd have a picture straight in. So within about two minutes, probably, of the ball going in, that would all be online. And as Fletch says, nowadays, most people are on their mobiles, and if you think about your, how you use a mobile phone, especially online, people have no patience now. 
I think we had an issue, something was slow to load and it was like eight seconds. And apparently that's just, it's too long. People haven't got eight seconds. I haven't got eight seconds to wait, so it's got to be up straight away. Um, and that's a little stat there. So during the World Cup, this is so during four weeks, 23.8 million people looked at those pages. So I looked it up. That's bigger than Australia. Um, so just to bear that in mind. Um, and that's that's just us. And obviously, there's everybody does these now. All newspaper sites, Sky. ITV, I think. So, as I said to you before, whatever you go into now, if you're going to be online journalists or newspaper journalists, this will probably be what you'll have to do a lot of. And don't just think of it as doing my job there. You'll be, as I said, people will be filing stuff in. So, I know you did one on the Tour de France you sent me last year. So, that's a good example of it's a whole team effort, not just the one person. So you've got one person sort of curating it, or a couple of people, but you might be asked to, a brilliantly vague description that we get, go and send some colour from, uh, <laughs> from the game. What that really means, no one really knows, but speak to some people, get some nice pictures. Um, and yeah, there's a, be fast and be right. Like I said, it's, it's not the most helpful of advice maybe, but it's just, it's true, it's what you need to be. Don't get it wrong. Mm. Um, don't get the score wrong. That's the worst thing you can do. If you flash that Leeds have scored when they haven't done that before, uh, you'll get all sorts of grief. Um, also, I'll use this slide because just an example of sometimes you'll get a moment in your career where you'll probably think, this is, this is crazy. And this game was, was that for me. So after 29 minutes, Brazil getting beat 5-0 by Germany. Just ridiculous. And... If you can imagine the BBC Sport offices at this time, no, I mean, literally no one could speak. It was just ridiculous. Everyone was panicking in a good way, thinking, well, this is... And that's another thing to bring up. When you're doing these live reporting, it, it triggers uh, new commissions for things. So whereas traditionally you might have waited for the game to finish and then someone will say, Oh, how about a nice piece on other great World Cup upsets or something? By the time this was 3 in after 20 minutes, we already, someone's digging out the biggest victories. What's the record winning a World Cup semi-final? Um, what's the worst ever performance by a Brazilian team? All that sort of stuff. So stuff happens much quicker now, and you have to adapt. So we talked about the planning. That goes out the window some nights. So... When, when Brazil are losing 5 nil after half an hour, no one's planned for that. I can tell you, no one's got that on the agenda. Um, I can think of an example recently when like, Cambridge played Man United in the FA Cup. So we had a big plan. It got to about 7 o'clock. Someone said, what do we do if Cambridge win? And we were like, ah, not, <laughs> they really, won't win. not really planned for that. But, uh, uh, when it's nil nil in the 90th minute and Cambridge are on the attack, you suddenly think, all right, we're going to be very busy in a minute if this, if this goal goes in. So just bear that in mind that it's not a fluid, it's not a set in stone what's going to happen. That's the beauty of it. That's why it's such a good job to do. You never know what's going to happen when you go to work on that day, really. And if you are writing one of these as well, it's worth stressing that um, when you've got five goals in 29 minutes and everybody's sending in their colour and you're trying to put loads of tweets in and you're trying to get loads of photographs in, and it just seems like you've got too much going on at once. Just keep it simple. Mm. You know, sometimes when there's not much happening, you can write a nice long entry and you know, really go to town on y your, your creativity. There's loads of goals happening. Just play it simple and describe it in one line because there's no point getting further and further and further behind. You see it with people who are less experienced. There's a lot going on and they try to write the same amount on each thing and mm. they get further and further behind and then you can see them start to get a bit uptight. It's very easy to go into a meltdown if you're not, if you're not careful. And it's live. A meltdown's not a good place to be, so <laughs> just keep it simple. Keep it simple and be accurate. They're definitely the two key things. I don't know if you can tell them a little bit about what this means, Fletch, but the point here is mm. that example there of the Germany game, say, that's one of those times where our traffic will go through the roof because people will be out in the pub or whatever or sort of not watching the game maybe 
and then they'll find out. But Germany are four 0 down after twenty mm. minutes, and then everyone mm. is piling into our website, and they just—it's like they can't believe it. Really, they need to find out why, what's going on. So this is a little graph that shows. This is our traffic at a certain time. It's not from the World Cup. It's from the other day. But when you get a big moment, like last night, I think there would have been one when uh, there was the spitting incident, and then so people, a lot of people are following games on Twitter. These games that aren't TV. So when something like that happens, or an even better example, when um, Suarez bit Chiellini, right? Just I remember I was doing the Eng England were playing. I think Costa Rica at the time, really boring, nil-nil. But I was doing that one, and then another guy next to me was doing Italy v Uruguay on a separate page. And not, not many people were reading that one. And then all of a sudden, he's sitting next to me, and he goes, I think, I think Suarez just bit someone. And then, again, similar to the Germany game, the whole office goes into absolute overload, get everything into that one. Everybody's into, no one's reading me anymore. Get it, nil-nil, <laughs> boring game. Um, it's interesting as well, that one, because we had a guy out in Brazil at that game. And that's where the Salford and Brazil thing come together, because um, the job that I was doing out in Brazil for that one, we had, I was in the IBC with my boss, and a lot of stuff was coming through us and then going back to Salford. So we had the guy at the Uruguay game who let us know what had happened. Um, and then we fed it back to Salford, and all the colour went in through us to mm. Tom, that's how that relationship happened. And then we had to tell him what to do. So he did his match report and he did a quotes piece, but everybody knew about it straight away. It was kind of, well, what are we going to do to follow this story up? So we told him to fly to where Uruguay had their training camp. And the next day, he was, um, in fact, the guy who did it, Ben Smith, did uh, a lecture here last year. I don't know if you remember him. And um, he found himself right at the centre of that story because um, he was the only English journalist there and he rang me up in the morning and said, well, what am I going to do? And I said, well, you're going to have to get really into these guys about Suarez. What are you going to do about it? What's going to happen? Are you going to put him up? But all the Uruguayans really turned on him. It was like, you British people have got it in for us. And he was <laughs> the only British guy there and they really gave it to him. But he really stuck up for his guns, so he was having a big argument with Uruguay's coach on a press conference at the World Cup the day after it happened. And um, Uruguayan TV were filming it, and it became quite a big story <laughs> on Uruguayan TV. Ben Smith was like, briefly, a figure of hate, more or less through all of Uruguay. He, he can't travel there now, can he? He, can, he yeah. cannot travel there, he's been he's banned. He's in the day over <laughs> dead um, Yeah. So, you know, that was a real good example of how these things happen really fast and you've got to react quickly and be nimble and you can really find yourself. I mean, that was probably the high point of his career because everybody over, you know, in the English media then wanted his story and he became sort of, he did this piece where he wrote how he had become, you know, almost at the center of a storm that involved some player in the World Cup, which was, was pretty unique yeah. and, you know, pretty amazing. But... The spike that we just saw there, that is a real-time device that we've got oh. that can tell you how many people are on the site at any one time. It's really good. In fact, it's really depressing in some ways because when you write a feature, the average time people spend in a feature is on average less than a minute. So you've spent days working on this piece and someone's given it 40 seconds. It's a bit dispiriting. But as soon as something happens, whoosh, everybody's on it. Look at everyone now. You look across this lecture theatre now, you see at least a dozen people on their phones, and they're all picking up that little spike, and that's where the traffic comes from. Everybody knows everything straight away. And for you as young journalists, you've got to be aware of that and react to it. Yeah, again, it's not just football, as, as we said before, keep mm. saying it, but it's true. Whatever you end up doing, you'll, you'll be asked, get something on the site straight away, get, get tweeting about it. Um, so this is just, I was trying to think of a sort of, almost a style guide, but there is no, everybody's got their own voice. Um, we encourage that, you know, don't, you don't want to all be the same. Um, but I picked this, this header here, because this is, oh, you've got a touch screen that's caught me up. Um, <laughs> this is, without doubt, the most spoken line on BBC Football Desk. After every single goal, <laughs> someone will say to me, our Stoke have scored last night. Oh, I've seen it's Victor Moses. Uh, who crossed it? Mm -hmm. no, no one ever knows. No one ever sees that. So 
whoever you do a football game, try and uh, you're always waiting for the replay, but try and try and find out. Um, so obviously the main thing, tell the audience what is happening. But if you just do that, it sudden it quickly becomes a very very dull operation for you and more importantly the the audience. So you have to have different references. I quite often reference niche 80s action films and things, probably not to everyone's taste, but as I say, everyone's got their style. Add some colour to it. What's, try and tell them what they can't see themselves, because as we've just said, a lot of people will be also watching this on TV and also reading what you're doing at the same time. So if you're just telling them what you can see, that's a bit dull. So that's where you use, use your guy in the stadium. Use your, when you're doing the Tour de France one, get the people who are at each little town and ask them what's going on, who, how many people are there, what's the sort of feel, and use the best analysis. Um, on the BBC, we're lucky we've got lots of pundits on radio and TV, and we have, as I said before, when there's seven or eight of us doing these things, it will be one or two people's jobs will be to, to get the best quotes for you from TV and radio and, and feed it into you. Um, use humour, I mentioned, but also... At the same time, it's got to be appropriate. So, for example, sometimes it's not. Last night, again, as an example, uh, a Swansea player collapsed on the pitch. And I can tell you, for three or four minutes, again, there was a sense of, we're going to go into overdrive here, this is a big story, because he went down off the ball. It was a bit like when uh, Fabrice Mwambo had his heart condition. So. At, at the same time, if I start making jokes about something happening at Stoke, not appropriate, and a guy's dying on the pitch, so you have to bear that in mind. Sometimes it's, it all comes again to being able to evolve and adapt on the beat. So at, when that happened, we had seven games on at once last night. Normally it would be an entry on each game, pretty much. But there, for sort of ten minutes, it was what's happening there. That's, that's the important thing. And luckily he was fine. And we were able to back to making silly jokes, but just keep just that in mind. So, just on that last slide as well, I think one thing that I would say about writing live text commentary is, is that you've got to find your own voice. Um, there's quite a few people out there who are good at writing live text. I wouldn't try and copy them. You'll have your own style. Yeah. You'll have your own things that you say, hopefully, that are funny or witty or you know, bring the audience in and drag them along with you. And you've got to find your own voice through practicing and developing your own style. Don't try and copy anyone because you'll just be a pale imitation. Um, another little stat on uh, the World Cup there just hits home that I mean, we get, we get these sort of figures <laughs> for the Premier League as well, perhaps sometimes more, but for the whole tournament. Um, when you think that all these games are on terrestrial TV as well, so you know, I was half expecting it to be be lower because when a game's only on Sky or BT, you sort of expect more people will come to us because they don't have those rights. But this this tournament sort of showed that even though everyone can see the games, they still want they want more. They want to know what the analysis is. They want to interact with us and tweet in and find out what everyone's thinking about it. It's it's that whole conversation that everyone has all the time now. You see it. Most I think some 60% of trending topics are TV shows or something, so it's not that people are doing it instead of, it's as well as. So everybody, you probably will do it when you're watching TV, you're tweeting about it now. That just gives us another uh, audience. Uh, again, they were, the, they were the top game, so that's that Brazil game when they, they got beat 7-1, <coughs> just shows that it's more popular than the final. Uh, and we'll gloss over the two England games. Uh, nothing, nothing much to see there. Um, so again, a bit like what we've said before, more mobile devices than ever now. I think you might know better than me. Tablet and mobile, what sort of percentage of our reach now? So, I mean, it's always been the case that mobile's been on the move, but now on a Saturday afternoon, a lot more people access our live scores and our live texts on mobile and tablet than do on desktop. I think it's something like 70, 30, although I could be slightly out there. So, you know, if you speak to the editors in our department, they would encourage you to think mobile first now. If you're thinking about anything, 
and what it's going to look like and how you're going to present it, you need to start thinking about what it's going to look like on a phone or a tablet rather than a desktop because simply more people access it on those devices. So you can, you can have a good idea for a, a lovely big infographic, say, lots of information, loads of colour, different stats, and then you've got to think it's got to fit on there and some, someone's got to read it. And like I said before, people have no patience. So there's no point in making it so you have to scroll out or anything. It's got to, it's got to work on a mobile screen straight away. Um, so yeah, that's anything else we need to talk about the World Cup? No, I think... <laughs> that's that nailed. Um, so we thought we'd end off, before we have some questions hopefully, on something that if you are looking at getting into football, particularly covering the football league. So a step down from the World Cup and the Premier League, but this is where realistic... Some of you might go straight into top flight, great, but a lot of you will start off on your local newspaper or uh, website covering the lower leagues. Um, and I did that for five years. Uh, probably covered several hundred matches at Watford and Reading and places like that on a Tuesday night. Um, so what, what, and Fletch did it for even, even longer, more games than I have. So what is that really like? So um, I thought I'd give you a little slide here. This is the glamour of the, the Football League. So this here is where Peterborough United have their um, press conferences after a game. It looks like the set of Phoenix Knights, and that's pretty much <laughs> what it's like. So you might, you might get sent to a really nice new ground, and you'll have Wi-Fi, and you'll have Waitrose soup at half-time and things, and it'll be lovely. But you might, get, you might get sent here, where the press box, it's like like your granddad's conservatory with like a lean-to bit of glass that you have, and there's only one way in. So if you're sat at the end and you want to get out, everyone's got to get up and you've got to climb over. And then afterwards, you come into this bizarre <laughs> setup where the manager comes through this door here, like he's in stars in your eyes, comes out just to meet you, and you're, you're all sort of huddled down here on these stairs. And I'll pick this one out because of all the hundreds of games I did, this is the only time I was ever absolutely terrified uh, because of this guy. So uh, <coughs> we did a game at Peterborough v Ipswich when Roy Keane was the, the manager there. And um, I, can't, I think they might have even won the game, I can't remember, but he came out and he was fuming um, with one man. And it was the guy who worked for the Ipswich local paper, which at the time would have been a, a tricky job, having to speak to this man three or four times a week. And on that day, he'd written a story saying, I can't remember the numbers now, but he'd written a story on the back page, big splash, saying, Roy Keane has told these players they're never going to play for my club again. It's never going to happen. All right. So he'd, he'd run a story. Um, he'd obviously been told this off the record or a good source that these four players were finished at Ipswich, never going to play. And then that night, I think all four of them started at Peterborough. So at half-time, a few of us who read the story were giving this guy a bit of light-hearted uh, grief, <laughs> saying, well, that was a good story. You got there. Excellent work. Um, so Roy Keane comes out, and if you're the journalist who's done something like that, you're probably thinking, I just hope he hasn't seen it. Let's just hope he, he's not read the paper. But Roy Keane came out, and he was reasonably nice at first. <laughs> he answered a few questions about the game, and then the guy who'd written the story asked him a question and the lights just went out and Roy Keane on this stage. So we were all cowering down here. On this <laughs> and Hiding under the yeah. table football. And to put it into perspective, this is not a big glamour game. It's a Tuesday night. So there was maybe six, seven of us for doing the national papers. Not many people at all. And Roy Keane sort of gets off his chair and he's, he's in this guy's face going mad at him. And I'd like to say that we all stood up and you know, told him he was out of order but I'd be lying. We all sat there. <laughs> I had my head in my laptop like that, just terrified. And then Roy Keane tore some strips off this guy, left, and then afterwards, everybody was saying, oh, you shouldn't have to deal with that as a very unprofessional. <laughs> um, but yeah, I can say I was terrified. And then the other time that I spent a lot of time was at Watford. I don't know if we've got any Watford fans in. I doubt it. Um, <laughs> 
But this stand here, you can see the glamour here. This was... Uh, so I think the second season I was covering Watford, I turned up on the first day of the season and made my way to the press box was in this stand here. And then I noticed after it got to about 2 o'clock, no fans in, they started filling in the other stands. Got to about half hour, 20 minutes before kick-off, still nobody sat here. So I said to the press officer at Watford, what's going on here? And he said, oh, yeah, this stand's been condemned. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not fit for human uh, habitation. So I was sort of thinking, well, we're still here. Oh, yeah, it's, fi it's fine for the press box, but uh, <laughs> can't have fans in here. And uh, the plan was, I think it was going to be rebuilt that season, and it was still there about four years later, because inevitably in the Football League, they ran out of money or they had a takeover or something. But it has now gone, and that is now the Sir Elton John stand. That It's a lot nicer looking now. Um, I've not been back since, but... But there you go. So if you get a job when you leave here covering uh, someone in League One, maybe... I mean, this is, this, could, this is much better than it could be. I'm sure Fletcher might have some stories of the lower leagues that are even worse. Well, there's one at this ground where, if you look at where Tom was up here, there was a, a game where QPR played Watford, mm. and they had this midfielder called Akos Buzaki, and he had a big argument with his manager, and after the game, the, the, uh, the press conference was here. And a guy came in, this journalist, and he said, uh, I've just seen a QPR player in the toilet. And some people, everybody ran out of the press box and went down and sort of stood in this little semicircle outside this public toilet <laughs> in the back of the stand. And after about 10 minutes, the player came out carrying and walked out and just walked straight out of the ground. He had a big argument. He went to hide in the toilet. And that was a great story, much more interesting than the match, which had yeah. been quite boring. So you never quite know where your story is coming from. I'm not saying you should keep an eye on toilets at football grounds, but you never quite know. You never know. Um, so that is about that, yes, Tom? Yeah, that's yeah. the end of our slides, yeah. So happy to be covered quite a lot there, but happy to take any questions on either live reporting itself or alternatively just covering football in general. Oh, no, I'll tell you what, I'll tell a lie. We've got one more thing, which is the your uh, opus. <laughs> Yeah, so this was something that we did ahead of the last World Cup that I thought would tap into a couple of different themes. One of them is about preparation. This took about three months to put together um, because... We should, say, we should say before, this is a, we had a meeting about this in about January time, maybe, mm -hmm. last year. We had to pitch for three or four big ideas that were sort of across the audience, so not just for sport fans, everybody. We went to this first meeting about this penalty shootout idea, and I said to Fletch, oh, that'd be not much work in that. That would be <laughs> easy. And then how long were we doing it? Months. <laughs> Finished it in June, just yeah. before the World Cup started. I got it all wrong. So it was all to do with World Cup penalty shootouts, and we wanted a different treatment for it. So this thing called I Wonder, I don't know whether you've seen any of those. There's hundreds of them now, not just sport, all subjects. And this was the first sport one that we did. And the way we put it together was we had to go to a company who had all the data about every penalty in a World Cup shootout. We had to negotiate a price and buy that data. And that effectively just bought thousands of numbers in spreadsheets that you had to go away and make sense out of. And then you had to try and make them interesting. So we had to get some graphic designers involved to work out what the most interesting numbers were and how you would tell a story with an editorial narrative, but visually. So stories you think of as being words, you know, 500 words, you're writing a feature, this, that, and the other. With mobile and the proliferation of mobile, it's worth noting that the more stories you can tell through graphics and infographics, the better, really. And this is the direction of traffic here. When I look at, you know, the directives we're getting off our editors and stuff, they want clear visual infographic stories. These work on Twitter, they work on social media, they work on mobile phones. This is the direction a lot of the stuff's going in. This also had some video in it and some, um, yeah. we got Gary Lineker on board, which was great because, you know, anything that he puts his name behind really works. It's quite hard getting his time. He's a man in demand, is Gary, but if you knock on his door long enough, it'll eventually open. And then, you know, we had, this is every single World Cup shootout penalty and where it went. 
and plotting this one graphic <laughs> took ages. And then, after the first draft, we realized we got the size of the goals wrong, so we had to do it all again. It just took forever. But I think it was worth it, because when we put that out on social media, it got shared hundreds of thousands of times. And this uh, shootout penalty I won the guy got a million hits. So sometimes, if you invest in a big project, you know, it can have its rewards, even though it's a bit frustrating along the way. And this was uh, called a hotspot. So when you click on these, it gives you a little bit of uh, info and video. And some classic Barry Davis as well. All these Germans wondering whether they will follow the leader and to win the European Championship. So that was the first miss in a shootout, which was by a German. Interestingly, never missed one since. So, but it's worth bearing in mind this when you work for someone like the BBC. This was all new, wasn't it? And me and Fletch had this idea of, oh, we'll just make this. When you click on this, you get a video. And there was a guy there looking a bit concerned. And then it turns out they had no idea how to do that. And we just said, oh, it'll be fine. Just, <laughs> just make it happen by June the 1st. It'll be easy. Um, and the same here. So the idea here is if you were taking a penalty, where would you put it? Mm. And then when you click on these, you get someone who did exactly that. Um, OK. Yeah, so that's, that's that. Any questions? Oh, good question. Mm. What, working for it or as a fan? Um, working, mine is definitely that Brazil-Germany game, just because that was like the semi-final, so we'd done, I'd maybe done 25 texts by then, live texts, or 20 or something. So you can get a bit, bit fatigued after it, because it was such a good, especially the group stages were so good that... It was really exciting coming into work every day, but at this stage you'd done, maybe had two days off in three weeks or something, and you're working through the night, so you, it's only natural you're going to get a bit tired. And then when it goes five nil after half an hour, it was just that was just brilliant to do. And like I say, the audience was was massive at the time, so you do get an impression of you're, you're speaking to two million people. It's pretty exciting. Uh, but like I said, it's also important not to let that play on your mind too much. I mean, you don't really have time to, but some people, when they do their first ones, you can see they, they start to think about it a bit too much. And, but yeah, that was probably mine. I would probably say Luis Suarez, but not the bite. Um, in 2010, when he got sent off in the quarterfinal for the handball, and then Garner missed the penalty, mm -hmm. and then he went straight into um, a penalty shootout. It's crazy. I've never known a more divided press box. 50% of that press box thought he did absolutely the right thing because his team won, and the other half thought he was a scoundrel of the highest order. And, you know, there was almost fights in the press area between people who were getting really belligerent and agitated about it. And it was a sight to behold watching grown journalists threaten to punch each other. A divided world. Is it worth maybe mentioning there, um, I don't know what sort of deadlines you've got at the minute, but it might be worth thinking like last night I was thinking of this I forgot about it when you do a, a game particularly in midweek you might have a deadline if you're writing for a newspaper you might have to file your full match report on about 70 minutes so obviously you're, you're filing it before the game's finished which is inherently a silly idea but their, their deadline for their papers is 10 o'clock or something half 10 um, so they need they need to get the words on the page before the game's finished. So what you get into is it's called a rewrite, which is you get a last minute goal that completely changes your entire report. And last night there was quite a few late goals and even in our office there was quite a lot of swearing at that sort of half nine, quarter to ten stage. You, you can't say that. No, 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 there wasn't. There was none none in the BBC. But um it's just bearing in mind if you've got a deadline, just think about when you when you're doing live stuff and again it doesn't have to be football. If you're doing a, a, a big court case, maybe, or something. Or You've got to stay calm. Yeah. Got to stay calm. Because if you start to get uptight, you'll make a mess, and you'll be even further behind. So. But there's a skill to that, isn't there? Mm. You, you, you learn to change everything you've written in 10 minutes or 5 minutes. And you might think, there's no way I can do this. But, but you will. You'll get the hang of it. Um, 
Any other questions? Um, you touched on using humour in live blogs earlier. I was just wondering how important that is when you're writing a blog all day or something. It's a good, good point. And again, it, it comes back to each one. Every person is different for a start. Um, and you, you have to sort of have your own style. And I wouldn't say just try and be funny, because that's probably the worst advice you can ever get if someone says, just try and be funny, mate. And you say, <laughs> well, I was trying. But, uh, and obviously, people find different things funny. Um, lots of people tweet me saying, I, you know, you're an idiot, what are you doing? But at the same time, some people really like it. So I think it depends what you're doing. Football is a good avenue for that, because you've always got two different sets of fans that you can sort of play off against each other a little bit and there's lots of elements of it that, that can be funny. I think, if anything, it, it helps you because sometimes we're writing these for six, seven hours, you know, without stopping, no breaks or anything. So you try doing that and after a few hours you, you can't help but you get a bit fatigued with it. I if think it's, it's crucial. If you want people to stay with you and you want, to, you want them to like you and engage with you, if you can make them laugh, you got them, it's half the job. And there's plenty of room for that in sport. Some stories don't lend themselves to it, but lots do. If he's doing a live text on a Saturday and it's seven hours long, there's loads of time around football when you've got the chance to try and make people laugh or put a witticism in there. And if you can make people laugh out loud, laugh out loud you know, like in anything in life, you're onto a winner. It comes down to, again, adapting yourself. So if you've got a time where there's four goals have gone in, mm. don't be sitting there thinking, hang on, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm just getting a good line here. Because uh, pe people want to know who scored. Like you say, you've got plenty of time to be funny. If you later. Can, if you can, yeah, later or earlier. But yeah, um, it, it's, it is mm. tricky, I guess. But as I said before, you'll have your own style and there'll be... I, I just sort of, I sort of write for myself a little bit, just things that come into your head that I find funny. And that's probably the best advice, because if you try and... If I said to you, try and make uh, a certain section of the audience like this, you know, you'd, you'd have no chance, really, would you? If not a professional comedian, that would be, that would be impossible. But yeah, it is, it is good. Any more? Hello? Oh, sorry. All right, um, in England versus Italy, whenever Sterling, everyone bloody scored. Mm. Yeah, well, I'll tell you a story about that. Um, I didn't type that it would be scored, don't worry. But uh, <laughs> where we work in the BBC, there's an annoying sort of quirk in that we obviously get the feeds of those games in, so we're not watching it on BBC One. We're watching it, it's sort of, I don't know how it works. It's, it's a few seconds ahead of the... But So we're, that's great. But then so on the other side of our floor, there's people who are even further ahead than us. Mm. So you get like a phantom... Mm. Cheers. There's no sometimes. surprises at no. all. It takes, um, so in that moment, some people on the far side of the room started cheering really loud. And at the time, you know, we had the ball in midfield or whatever. So then Sterling shoots and everyone's like, oh, that's a brilliant goal. Yeah, and you almost write in England 1, Italy 0. It goes back to what I said about there's no filter on that publish button. If I'd, if I'd have published that, obviously I could have changed it, but you'd have looked like a right idiot. So, yeah. That is, uh, I, I did think it was in to answer your question, definitely. And sometimes you get that where you don't, you don't really know what's happened. Um, I guess my advice there would be, if you, if you don't know, you don't know. You know, the worst thing you can do is guess. Uh, like last night, again, there was a spitting incident with two players who allegedly spat at each other. And there's seven games at once last night. So I wasn't really watching that game particularly closely. But someone, someone was watching it, and they said, oh, I think he's spat at him. Now, I could have, I, I could have just guessed and said, oh, John, Johnny Evans has spat at him. But, I mean, if you don't know, you don't know. So don't, it's much better to wait until you've seen it properly and mm. people can look at it. Now, I guess... Be right second and wrong first <laughs> would be my advice yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that, again, we're quite lucky with the sort of resources we've got. We've got more than one set of eyes and everything, whereas you might end up doing one on your own somewhere. But if you don't take a chance, basically, if you don't know, and even more important, there's much more important things than football you could be writing on, a new story. Don't make an assumption that you... This is the same as if you was writing a story, basically. It's just a quicker process. Any more? Hello?
What do you look for in a person to become a BBC sport journalist? Good question. Um, I think there's lots of different things you're looking for there. Ideas, um, attitude, um, hard work. I guess, I think a lot of people in this room are probably in a good place right now because one of the things that the BBC are looking to do at the moment is try and improve their engagement with an audience whose demographic you are smack bang in the middle, the 16 to 34s or whatever. The BBC audience, website audience, is getting older as the website gets older and what they want to do now is get more younger people in there and I think there's some people within the BBC who aren't 100% sure how you do this. I'm not sure there's anyone anywhere who knows exactly how you do it. So, you know, you, you need to come with new ideas and I think you need to play to your strengths and your advantages. You're all young, you know, you all access devices in a way that weren't available when I was your age and all that sort of stuff. So you need to bring that, you know, along with you. But I think that, you know, ideas, experience, willingness, a lot of people as well, you know, they've started out doing work placements and they've got to know people at the BBC. And once you get in, to inside the BBC, then, you know, there's a possibility to move around because it's a big organisation. Getting in can often be the hardest thing. Be passionate as well, I mean... Mm. It's such a competitive field, all journalism is, but sport probably more than, than a lot of places, and there's so many people who want to do it. So if you, if you get a chance on a placement, or just try and show that you really want to you really do it. There's, there's nothing worse, I guess, than someone who comes on a placement and sort of doesn't say anything to anyone. No. You sort of make no impact. None whatsoever. You've really got to push yourself out, though, even if it's not your natural personality. If you've got a chance, you've got to seize it. And also, I think... You've got to just, you know, get over the little bumps in the road. If you apply for a job and don't get an interview, apply for it again. You know, they've just taken on some new staff now, and I know that some of them have applied for those jobs half a dozen times, had two or three interviews, and have finally got through the door, and they couldn't be more made up about it. But, you know, rejections will come your way. Just um, put them to one side and go again. It took me about three years, I think, from first applying to, to get in a job, so don't give up on it. <laughs> then jobs go. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> There's always jobs going. Yeah. Uh, we've got one last question. Anybody want to ask anything else? Yeah. Most challenging, apart from Roy Keane. Keane. You have different challenges, don't you? There's people who uh, are perfectly nice and friendly. You start talking to them and they just don't say anything to mm. you. Um, I can think of a f quite a lot of footballers like that, to be honest. <laughs> Nearly all of them. I mean, uh, some of them are challenging, aren't they? In the Roy Keane, is terrifying, going to rip my head off sense. But he's good as good copy. But he's good copy. Uh, and there's another guy, he's not in football, but the, the Leeds Rhinos coach, Brian McDermott. I interviewed him once when he was at Leeds, uh, London Broncos. And, I mean, everybody in that room was terrified. I mean, that guy used to be the British Marines heavyweight boxing champion and when he loses his temper you don't want to be anywhere near him and he lost his temper with this guy and this guy was he started sweating he was going really <laughs> red and it's the same thing with Tom you know it's just collective cowardice we all sort of <laughs> sat there and looked at the floor and thought I'm not saying anything here and then as soon as McDermott left the room we were like man he was well out of order but the other thing is you, you're more boring com sports yeah. people your more right. common challenge will be Every sportsman you talk to will be really boring. Dull. Yeah, not every dull. sport, every top Premier League player now who has come through the system has been media trained. They've been media trained to not say anything that will land them or their <laughs> club in hot water. So often, your biggest challenge is getting something interesting out of somebody who's been trained to be boring. And he's probably naturally quite boring anyway, so that's a <laughs> double challenge. <laughs> but you can do it, you just have to keep working at it, I guess. Go ask them the same question again and again and again and again in different ways until they finally say something interesting. Okay. okay, I think we'll just stop it there, but I'm sure you'd be uh, wanting to give you a uh, thank the guys for coming in. One of the things I would say about stuff like this is Dean obviously tells you a lot about the fact it's not glamorous and we talk about that and uh, how you cover sport. There is no handbooks on stuff like this. This is just happening now, it's never happened before. 
Um, and until you do it, you're probably not going to get the experience to do it. Obviously, in this second year now with sports journalists, we're going to have a go at doing something like this. Mm. I had a go at doing the live text for the Tour de France. Lasted about four hours. I was absolutely knackered by the end of it. It's really hard work. Yeah. Um, and you've got to kind of have that experience to kind of get good at it, I think. You sleep well after it. Yeah, <laughs> I would say. How many words do you reckon we do on a Saturday? Oh, you know, seven, eight thousand. Yeah, it's like a dissertation and a shift and it basically. Although, it's not all your own work, but yeah, it is tiring, mentally tiring. Mm. But uh, if, you, if you can just show your appreciation for it, <laughs>